Fewer than 7,000 Eastern Lowland gorillas, also called the Grower's gorilla, are estimated to remain left in the wild. But there's hope for this critically endangered species. Located in North Kivu province in the Eastern region of the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Gorilla Rehabilitation and Conservation Education Center, known by the acronym GRACE, is the only sanctuary dedicated to the Grower's gorilla. While their work centers on gorillas, GRACE models a community-first approach to conservation, a method that is increasingly necessary if wildlife conservation is to succeed in the 21st century. Hi everyone, this is Mike Fitz, the resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. One of my favorite cams on explore.org is the gorilla cam located at the Grace Sanctuary. During this live broad broadcast, we'll explore the work of Grace. First, we'll learn about the care of rescued Grower's gorillas from Jackson, Kamboyana, and Beke, the director of the Grace Sanctuary. And then I'll be joined by Dr. Katie Fawcett, Grace's program director, to discuss a recent great ape survey in the Taina Nature Reserve, an area near the Grace Sanctuary that local communities can serve to protect forests and ancestral lands. Dr. Fawcett will also be available to answer a few of your gorilla questions at the end of the chat. To begin though, let's turn our attention to the Grace Sanctuary in the heart of the Grower's Gorilla Range. It's located in the Eastern region of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The center is the only sanctuary in the world dedicated to the Grower's Gorilla, and it is staffed entirely by local Congolese residents. It currently houses 14 gorillas, all of whom were rescued as orphans after poachers killed the infant's mothers and extended family. Amazingly, the, the rescue gorillas have bonded into a cohesive group like that of a wild gorilla family. Jackson, Jackson Mbeke is the director of the Grace Sanctuary. He's been at Grace since its infancy and has won several conservation awards for his work. The long-term goal of the Grace Sanctuary is to release their captive gorillas into the wild. But until then, Jackson leads the DRC team to ensure the gorillas are safe and healthy. I sent Jackson several questions about the Grace Sanctuary and his work there, which he discussed with our upcoming guest, Dr. Kitty Fawcett. Hi, Jackson. Um, please, can you introduce yourself to the audience on Explore? Jackson Kabuyaya Mbeke, the Grace DRC Director. Jackson, how did you become involved in the conservation of gorillas? Actually, I've uh, uh, involved in the uh, gorilla conservation. Actually, it was my vision uh, since I was a child. And, uh, you know, in my village, which is called Kaina, I was uh, seeing these uh, ranches from Virunga. Actually, Kaina is near the Virunga National Park. So we could see these ranches with good uniforms, uh, in good cars, good life. So this really inspired me to become part of them. Then uh, I talked to my father and uh, he said, yes, whenever you will uh, reach that level, I will send you to Cameroon to uh, continue studies for conservation. Then unfortunately uh, he passed away before he does that, but I kept hope. Then after a while, fortunately I got uh, a scholarship uh, from Dani Fossi Gorilla Found International through a uh, Taina Nature Reserve. I studied and uh, then I did many training courses in the reserve and uh, then in uh, Virunga uh, National Park, actually with uh, a Gorilla Monitor. Then I became really more interested and uh, then after the studies at DCCB, I mean uh, uh, Taina, I then come to Greece. So that's where I am and I'm uh, really proud of what I'm doing uh, conserving gorillas. Great, Jackson, thank you. And could you just describe for us what is the Grace facility? Grace is a site uh, which welcome all these often gorillas uh, gotten from illegal trade. So we welcome uh, this uh, often gorilla 
just to give them a second chance to become again well. So we take care of them after they go through the quarantine. We put them together with the other family. And uh, then we, with an ultimate uh, purpose to reintroduce them one day in their natural habitats. So that's uh, what I can describe briefly. Thank you, Jackson. And these gorillas that you're caring for, uh, Grace, are all orphan gorillas. And could you tell us a little bit about how quickly the orphan gorillas adjust to their new home? And how do the gorillas at Grace react to their, their new arrivals? Yeah, you know, when we have a new baby coming, we get him in a quarantine. That's where we check him about his health. And uh, after a while, when we think that he's healthy, we just uh, start the integration process, which is really a process where we have to uh, get this, this family be aware of that there is a new one who will soon come. So the caregiver uh, start going near the, the enclosures when gorillas are uh, in there and they can know uh, up front that we have new who is uh, going to come. So when we start, we finish that um, uh, pre-integration, we go to the integration and then we, it, it, in grace, we never really get trouble with that. Uh, whenever a new uh, baby come in the family, we have a special mother who is called Pinga, who always take care of these baby gorillas. So it's really special. We never get accident and uh, it's, uh, all, it's always smoothly done. Very interesting. Thank you, Jackson. And how have you protected the grace gorillas during Ebola epidemics, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and armed conflict in the region? Yeah, during uh, Ebola and COVID, we really uh, followed on the letter this hygienic protocol. We have to wash our hands at the entries and uh, wash our body before we get on the site. And then we could get temperature for everyone. So during the day, we could have a system of washing hands. Uh, like at the morning, at noon, and at the afternoon. And before uh, every session of washing, we had a mandatory of uh, whistling. So we could have someone with a whistle, and then everyone could be aware of that, oh, that's the time of uh, washing. So we did that, and uh, we went through uh, that uh, 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 that, that disease. Then with the armed group, actually it was thanks to community. We went through, you know, this project is a, a community project. And then even if we can have a trouble uh, armed group, they all know that, that with the community, we cannot touch. So it's uh, thanks to community, we went through such a bad period of COVID. Wonderful. And is there one gorilla that you feel especially connected to? And yeah, if so, why? Connect, yeah, I'm connected to, to Pinga. Pinga, who is really a great, great mother. And uh, I feel that she's really uh, responsible. That's why I'm connected to her, as you know taking care of a new baby, uh, even for human, someone you don't know is somehow difficult. But then Pinga, she'll always take care of uh, new uh, babies coming in the family. Very nice, very nice. And what changes have you seen with the gorillas as they've matured and grown up over time in the sanctuary? I've seen uh, really that structure which is uh, uh, in the family. You know, when they were 
too small. They could play without with each other without knowing who was the boss, who was not. So nowadays, as they are growing, uh, we can have uh, the silver bag coming. Then we say, okay. Then we can see this hierarchy, this structure. And apart from that, of course, they as as they are growing, they can really eat much. Like these changes I've noticed. Excellent. And um, what can people in the United States and elsewhere do to help gorillas and the people in DR Congo? I think by supporting uh, sanctuary uh, costs, I think through that it, uh, it can be a very good way of uh, protecting uh, gorillas. And apart from that, to support these uh, community projects, I think that can really help a lot. Thank you ever so much, Jackson. And a final question is, what do you enjoy most about your work? Talking to people. I love talking to people and uh, manage people and find solutions. Excellent. Thank you ever so much, Jackson. Thank you very much. That was Jackson Mbeke, the director of the Grace Sanctuary in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Jackson has been part of the Grace effort since the very beginning, and he has remained committed to the guerrillas through violent insecurity, Ebola outbreaks, and now the COVID pandemic. So thanks to him for taking the time out of his day to share his work for us. Uh, now, though, let's... Uh, Let's, let's uh, bring in our uh, next guest. Uh, Grace offers sanctuary for orphaned uh, growers gorillas, but the long-term goal, of course, is to ensure the existence of healthy po populations of gorillas in the wild. In 2020, a, a team from Grace led a great ape survey into the Taina Nature Reserve in the Eastern DRC to survey for chimps and gorillas. And to discuss that expedition and its importance, I'd like to welcome uh, the person that you saw speaking with Jackson just a, a moment ago, Dr. Katie Fawcett, uh, to the conversation. Katie is the program manager uh, for for Grace. Uh, and Katie, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be with you. And if you have questions for Katie about gorillas, we'll try to answer, again, a couple of those towards the end of the chat. So you can drop those in the comments below the live camera feed, and uh, we'll get to those in a few minutes. Uh, Katie, to begin our conversation, though, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, geography and community engagement um, in this area, specifically with um, the Taina survey that happened in 2020. So can you can, uh, tell us where uh, Taina is and what makes it a special model for conservation? Yes, yeah, certainly, Mike. So as you, as you mentioned, Taina Nature Reserve is in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo right on the easternmost edge of the vast Congo Basin. Um, it's primary intact forest, an area of about 900 square kilometers. And as well as being kind of flat, there's also significant hills and mountains within, within the reserve. And that reserve is super remote and isolated. There's no vehicle access there. There's no roads really as we know it going through the reserve. So, um, it's this area of, of forest in the Congo Basin. And what's particularly special about this forest, sorry, to just to go on to answer about the reserve is how it's managed. So this managed is, uh, sorry, this reserve is owned and managed by the local community. So this is quite unique and different from other protected areas in Congo, which were created during the Belgium colonial era. And often local people were moved out of the reserves in order to protect the wildlife um, within, within the reserve. But here at Taina, the local people are driving and leading the conservation of the protected area. Yeah, that really does seem to make it different than what I know, at least from U.S. national parks. Um, you know, in, in the U.S. too, uh, research of the, you know, of, of surveys and wildlife surveys, for instance, uh, really often only needs permission from the bureaucracy. Uh, so how important was it for uh, for community buy-in and to have community communities engaged uh, when 
when you're working in this region? And could this survey of the reserve even have happened without it? You know, absolutely not. It was the engagement of the of the community, the involvement in the planning, the preparation um, was paramount, paramount to the success of the survey through this area. So the photos you're seeing are our community meetings. As I mentioned, this area is super remote. There's no email communication. There's no telephone communication. There's just walking and meeting. So a series of community meetings were he held where people would walk for many days to attend to talk about the plans and preparations and goals and objectives for conducting the survey. And who conducted the survey uh, its, itself? Um, from what I've read, it was uh, mostly local Congolese residents, but maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So all of the members of the field te team were hired from within the local community, hired and trained. And we had positions from the team leaders, to the porters, to cooks, um, to the trackers. Um, so there was lots of roles and responsibilities and everybody who participated came from the villages located within the Taina Nature Reserve. And how does GRACE work to provide economic opportunities that are linked with guerrilla conservation for the people uh, in those communities and the communities around the GRACE Center? Yeah, so GRACE is actually one of the largest employers, if not the largest employer in the area. So are fundamentally by employing our staff to manage our sanctuary and to conduct conservation activities like the, like the survey, we're bringing economic opportunities to this area of extreme poverty um, in this remote area, area of Congo. Um, so that's kind of our primary, if you like, economic driver in sourcing food, sourcing uh, materials for infrastructure, constructing roads, um, or maintaining roads for, for, for access. Um, but also we work with the with communities to help with projects that will both improve conservation outcomes, but also importantly uplift the community. And we have work with women's groups with small domestic livestock projects, um, which will help provide a source of protein other than hunting for uh, wildlife. Um, we have projects that would support uh, fuel efficient stoves, which would reduce the need to enter the forest to collect firewood um, and also improve the health for people who are cooking over the, the smoking uh, traditional, traditional stoves. Let's talk a little bit now about some of the nuts and bolts of the survey and what information was collected. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to know why you chose the survey in Taina instead of other places within the range of the Grower's Gorilla. Yeah, thank you, yeah. So as GRACE was established over 10 years ago in this area, adjacent to the reserve, it was established and in invited by the community that's interested in, in pursuing conservation of the area to establish the sanctuary there. And a lot of work and effort went into creating the, the sanctuary. But meanwhile, conservationists and researchers were surveying Grower Gorillas throughout their their, uh, their landscape or their, their area, their, their range in Eastern DRC. And the results which were coming in from the forest throughout were the same. The numbers were plummeting. It was drastic. The decrease um, over time led to the change in the classification to critically, the IUCN classification to critically endangered. So the area to the close to our sanctuary in Taina was an area that hadn't been reached for surveys. It was very remote, very inaccessible, uh, difficult for, for survey teams to, to reach. And so Grace was asked to help facilitate um, the survey in that area. And we we're a natural partner for guerrilla conservation being based there um, adjacent, adjacent to, the, to the reserve. So as you said right at the beginning, Mike, it's important not only to protect the 14 gorillas in our sanctuary, but protect those populations of wild gorillas too. And what information did the survey teams collect when they're out in the field? So I mean, really our primary objective is to try and confirm the presence or absence of gorillas and chimpanzees in this area of, uh, of forest. It had been a long time since there'd been any um, real survey work in, in, this, in this region. 
And so here you can see a map of the reserve and each of those straight lines is a two kilometer transect. So the survey teams walked each and every one um, of those uh, straight lines looking for not gorillas and not for chimps, but for signs of chimps and gorillas. And by signs, we mean signs of maybe feeding trails, um, poop or dung. And then also every night, gorillas and chimpanzees make nests from vegetation. So the team would count and, um, and record observations of, uh, of nesting of the apes either on the ground or here you can see up in, up in a tree. So we weren't actually counting gorilla, we were counting gorilla signs. And what, what sort of physical challenges did the survey teams face when traveling to the survey locations and, and when they were conducting those transects too? Yeah, well, I think as you can see, we had rivers to cross on the way there. Um, it was four days walk just to arrive in the area from our base on the edge at Grace to some of the different areas. We are using uh, bridges to cross and that terrain is hilly um, mountainous west, particularly where the gorillas are found or in these like rocky outcrops, if you like, through the through the through the reserve. Um, so the, and the teams did an amazing job of sticking to those predetermined uh, st straight transect cutting straight through through the through the forest. And then when we were planning the survey, we were like, OK, when's the rainy season? And we were the response we got back is 12 months of the year. There is rain all year round. So yeah, it was a wet, a wet experience too, wet and muddy. And uh, I have and to- uh, were out, Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I have to tip um, my, a virtual hat to the people who conducted that survey because I've never been to Africa, but I've done a lot of bushwhacking in my time. And if, if anyone's never really done that, tried to follow a straight line through thick forested mountain habitat uh, without the, you know, the, uh, the advantage of a road or a trail. I mean, it is rough, rough work. So to do that over and over for a period of weeks at a time, I mean, that must have been some really arduous work. So, so great job to that team. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, the, you know, they're in there, they're counting gorilla sign, um, they're looking for chimpanzee sign. What did the survey reveal? Um, about the populations of, of chimps and gorillas in the area? So I think that the overwhelmingly good news was that there were several signs of gor both gorillas and chimpanzees throughout the reserve. So lots of sign that there is a significant population of growl gorillas and chimps which are worth protecting in that area. Now, we don't get estimates of it. We didn't, we, again, we weren't counting every single gorilla. Um, we weren't getting estimates of population size, but we we're getting an idea of their distribution and, and abundance within within the reserve. And One of the curious things. Out, as the, oh, sorry. Go ahead, I was please. Say, I should point out that as the as the teams are bushwhacking through and collecting information on gorilla sign and chimp sign, they're also collecting information on other mammals in the forest too. So other species of monkey, uh, some carnivore species. We also collected data on gray parrots. Because this is an opportunity to collect information, um, or, or, you know, on all types of biodiversity, and also on human activities in the park, so we could get an idea of where human trails, maybe where there might be camps with within the forest. So yeah, you can see here. This is all those multicolored dots, um, the different signs of animals which were observed throughout the reserve, and those larger kind of neon blue dots are the signs of gorilla throughout the reserve if you can make out those differences and one of the things i read um that was a little curious to me about um the survey was that the the teams didn't actually see any chimps or gorillas um only their only their signs so can you maybe explain why that might have been yeah absolutely. i mean i think it's quite incredible especially when we're looking at your photo it's a huge silverback gorilla behind you that how could the teams not see gorillas as they're going through the forest and it's amazing how these big black shapes <laughs> disappear into the undergrowth but also we have to remember that in the wild the gorillas are not habituated and what habituated means is habituated to human presence or used to human presence so way before we people would get anywhere near a gorilla a branch would break a voice would be heard and 
a gorilla and chimp would be gone. So it's not possible to actually take data on sightings of gorillas. That's why we have to rely on the, the, the signs the gorillas and chimps leave behind as they move through the, as they move through the area. And actually one way we'll do for counting in a long term to try and get to that idea of how many gorillas is through collecting their poop. So by collecting their poop, that can be analyzed for their genetics. And we can actually identify individual gorillas over time, building up a picture of the, of the gorilla population in the reserve. And if we could bring up that map, <laughs> well, I, I was just um, wondering if we could bring up that that uh, that graphic. Yes, this one here of the animal mm -hmm. signs once again, because uh, it, it seems like the gorillas were concentrated in in certain areas of the reserve, and I, I wonder if you sort of agreed that they seem to be concentrated in, in in certain places, and why that might be. Is there any patterns? regarding their distribution that you can kind of tease out from this info? Yeah, that's something that we're, the scientists are continue to, to look into, but it does seem that they're concentrated in areas that have um, lower uh, frequency of human sign. And it's not unusual to, to think that there would be a negative correlation between signs of human activity and signs of wildlife. But there's also differences in altitude with the gorillas in higher altitude um in rockia and differences in ecological zones where the gorillas are found so we'll do, do further kind of deep dive into that information to get a better understanding of their their distribution and how has grace built upon the data gathered in 2020 i understand that you're still you know looking at much of the um the evidence that was collected and and you mentioned genetics um so what else have you done with the, with the info yeah, no, that's, that's great. So following the success of the of the survey and of the coming together of the, the community and the training, um, since then, Grace has been able to engage ongoing monitoring teams in the reserve. So now we have three teams that are constantly in the forest gathering further information about gorilla, um, gorilla sign. Well, one team is retracing those transects so that we can get an ongoing idea of how animals might change over time. But another couple of teams are actually following one gorilla group. So they're following them from night nest to night nest to try and get more detailed understanding about the life of a particular gorilla group. And that's not as easy as it sounds, Mike. So not only are you bush bushwhacking, but now you're bushwhacking and trying to follow a delicate trail and trying to follow that trail as groups of other gorillas cross that trail. Um, to try and get an understanding of the, the gorilla behavior, their diet, their ranging patterns. What does a gorilla need to survive in Taina Nature Reserve? And yeah, and I thought tracking animals project, in the snow is difficult. Well, <laughs> yeah. But please continue. Well, I was just going to say another way that we're doing, trying to address this, how to see the animals, is we've been placing camera traps in the reserve. And we're super excited to have our first return of photos from the camera traps. And just in our first couple of months of observing, we were able to get photos of both gorillas and chimpanzees and other primates that are only found in this area of the world. So we're super excited to, to see what comes from the, the camera trapping projects too. We, and we did hear Jackson um, talk a little bit about this, um, but I'm curious in, um, for the answer to this question in regard to the survey too. So how has like unrest and disease outbreaks like Ebola and COVID affected, you know, Grace's approach to research um, in the area? Yeah, that's a good question, Mike. And um, as Jackson explained, Grace has, has come through many challenges or faced many challenges in the past before we arrived at this current COVID pandemic. Um, and so, we really have have built the team on the ground has a lot of resilience a lot of capacity um and a, a, a tremendous as jackson says he loves to problem solve so a tremendous capacity to cope with adversity so when the the survey was planned we were actually i think it was the 
the uh, end of February 2020, we had the last community meeting before launching this, the, 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 the survey. And as we all know, what happened in March 2020, like the world shut down with the COVID pandemic. And so did we. But then after a few, a few months, the team came back and they're like, we don't want to stop. We can't stop. We've already stopped for Ebola. We've stopped for insecurity. And so we had to adapt to how we move through to continue to work, uh, pr uh, completely respecting all biosafety protocols for the gorillas, for people. Um, but through pivoting to remote training, our scientists were also doing remote teaching in universities here in the US. They took that tool that they'd learned to do remote training with our team leaders who then trained the rest of the teams to uh, conduct the survey work. So it was a little bit adapted. Uh, it took a lot longer on the training, but the capacity was built and the, the, uh, the survey completed. So we were actually kind of proud, like at the end of that year, how much we did achieve, despite the obstacles the teams faced that year. Yeah, and you very well should be. I mean, it's such a challenging endeavor. It's such a remote, um, you know, area of the world. Again, I, I think about the ease of travel um, that I can experience in the United States, where if I want to get somewhere, I can get on my bicycle or I can get in a car or I could get on a train or an airplane and fly to different locations. But it's it's not like that in many parts of the world. So so, yeah, again, another another hat tip to everybody who's helped to coordinate that and and um, conduct the survey we we do have um, a, a, bu a bunch of audience questions um coming in and um it seems like uh, they're along kind of like two fronts uh, we got some questions about the survey themselves and then some questions about um the gorillas at the grace sanctuary and we we know that the the cameras for the Grace sanctuary aren't live right now um, but we hope to um, get those lives, uh, get the, those cam that camera live once again, ASAP, maybe as soon as next week. No promises, though. Um, again, it's it's logistically challenging to do so. So we're hoping mm -hmm. that's the case. But um, Katie, um, wondering if you could uh, answer a couple of questions about the gorillas in the sanctuary. Um, of course, people are very curious about what, yeah, what makes it possible for for gorillas. Our first question here. Um, to behave and adopt newcomers and, and really create a family. I think that's one of the really interesting things about the um, the group of gorillas at the Great Sanctuary is they are, they are a blended family. They're not genetically re um, related or at least blood relatives like we would consider them to be cousins or something like that as, as far as I know. So what gives them that, uh, that ability to adapt and, and, and adopt um, newcomers into, into their group? I think that's a really, really good question. And I think it's the quest the answer to that amazes us all every day. So not only are they a blended families, but they didn't really know family. They were all taken from their own families, age three or younger. So they never experienced family. So when you look at the orphan Pinga, who was ripped from her family at age three, and there she is as the surrogate mother, raising all these other uh, orphan gorillas, it's, it's really incredible to, to think about. Now, these gorillas, have, what's really important is that the, the gorillas do have each other. So when the gorillas were first uh, confiscated, they've been together as a, as a young group, and then they've aged as a group. And it's been remarkable to see as they've aged, how they've matured in, in, into a family. I think providing the gorillas with space to be social and providing the gorillas with each other, uh, giving the gorillas the space to be gorillas, the habitat to be able to exercise, to forage, to search for their own food, um, to learn their survival critical skills, I think is, is also important. But um, yeah, we were just amazed at how this gorilla family has grown into a gorilla family. And Jackson mentioned, um... The, the gorilla that he feels very connected with, who's, um, who's named Pinga, uh, somebody was wondering about her and what, uh, and specifically what happened in Pinga's life that drives her to readily foster um, the babies as they are introduced uh, to Grace. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what her individual story is um, from when, when she was rescued, she has been, um, a confident, strong-minded, um, resilient individual. Every every gorilla 
has their own story when they are um, when they are first rescued. Some can be withdrawn for a while, um, or many w w will suffer that. Um, and and Pink has always just always just been a very strong lady. Um, so we are very fortunate to to have Pinga to have been able to be that role model. Now she's not the only gorilla that. Uh, taken on that adoptive role, but she's by far the, um, what would you say, the model mother gorilla in the, in the group. I think she's a role model for um, not only gorillas but also for people as well. And I think we can find a lot of a lot of a lot of great things to admire in in Pinga. Uh, one one final question about the um, about the the group of gorillas at Grace before we have a couple of community and survey related questions from the audience. Uh, how does uh, Grace find the orphans? Um, so can you sort of elaborate on how the gorillas get to the sanctuary where they where they're recovered from or rescued from? Yeah, so the gorillas are all victims of, of poaching in general in their area. Um, a gorilla may a gorilla family usually the whole family group because with a with a gorilla family if there's a poaching incident the silverback will come forward to defend his family the group will come together and usually the whole we can expect that the whole family will be shot now the infant might be taken it's still clinging often to its mother's body and attempted to be sold through the illegal wildlife trade now the the national park authorities in, 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 in Congo is responsible for confiscating um, and stopping that illegal trafficking. And if they come into possession of, a, of an infant gorilla, they will then contact Grace to come and help to take, uh, or to bring the gorilla to take care um, of the gorilla from that point forward. And a, a couple of questions real quick here about the survey itself. Um, you know, one, that, one of the things that I neglected to ask you is, is how long did it take to um, complete the survey of the Taina Reserve? Yeah, so that's a great question. So it's four months the teams were in the fields, rotating around to complete to complete the uh, to complete the survey. And so for because of COVID, one of the security protocols we had in biosecurity protocols was four months without seeing their fam family and friends during that time to complete the survey. And we talked a lot about, you know, community engagement and how that was really important for the survey um, to happen. Uh, and this is a, a question related to that. Uh, how did you manage to persuade, you know, the local communities to go with conservation efforts as opposed to something that, you know, might find in the United States or my country, Poland, where it's often quite difficult to do that? I think that's a, that's a really excellent question, and that's really what's unique about Taina Nature Reserve. The communities there came to conservation as a solution for their for their livelihoods. So it was actually the communities that came to the international conservation community <laughs> um, and requested to be stewards for their natural heritage, and in doing so, they secured their land tenure rights. They secured rights to their land. Um, and, and recognized and tied that, that their future is tied to the health of the forest. So it is, it's a very unique, very different scenario than the way that we might manage protected areas in other, area, in other areas of the world. And my final question for you is uh, one that I think probably a lot of people are wondering, uh, but how can those of us who are watching you know, help the Grace team? How can we help gorillas? And how can we help the people who live in and around uh, the gorilla habitat? Yeah, th thank you ever so much. Thank you ever so much, Mike. Yeah, um, I think, you know, doing exactly what everybody here on the call is doing is learning more, learning about the gorillas, learning about the region in the world. Um, if, we, if you go to our Facebook page, you'll see that there's 10 different ways how you can help help gorillas, how to be a hero for gorillas. It can be a bit overwhelming to see the 10 different the ten different ways, but I'd encourage you just to choose one and start there, something that talks to you. Whether you've got an old phone that you need to recycle, um, or if you just want to like, follow, and share to, uh, to spread the good news um, of the work of the, the communities in protecting growers, gorillas in this part of the world. 
So there's lots of different options for everybody there. Well, I've really enjoyed our conversation um, today. Um, and I think Grace is, is modeling something that's um, very important, a very important strategy for conservation going forward. Uh, because the original model for land and wildlife conservation in the United States more or less separated people from wildlife habitat. Um, and you mentioned some of the national parks in the Congo during the Belgian colonial period um, were created some, somewhat in the same way. So it's, you know, some of our national parks and some of um, our protected areas are an extension of colonialism. And it, it did trigger a lot of injustices. Uh, but now, you know, so many conservation organizations, and especially Grace, um, my own thinking has changed in this regard, how the fate of people and wildlife and wildlands, they're not separate entities anymore. Uh, so Grace models a different approach to conservation and one that acknowledges that the well-being of local people and wild animals like gorillas go hand in hand. So, uh, Dr. Fawcett, thanks so much uh, for joining me today and, and sharing your, your uh, time and expertise. Thank you ever so much for having us here today, Mike. Thank you. Dr. Katie Fawcett is the program manager for the Gorilla Rehabilitation and Conservation Education Center. Earlier, we heard from Jackson Mbeke, who is the director of the Grace Sanctuary in the Democratic Republic of Congo. If you want to learn more about their work, go to gracegorillas.org. A lot of great information there. And of course, you can watch uh, the gorillas on our webcams at explore.org slash gorillas. And we're going to get those live to you as soon as we can. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. Thanks for joining me today. And remember, as we like to say here at Explore, never stop learning.